What cool stuff are you drinking there? It's a ginger shot. Vive Organic. That's it. What's it do for you? Oh, keep me keep me energized. I'm on a um I've been on a I've been on a strict diet for the last three months. Cause um in March I'm planning on giving a kidney to my sister. Wow. So so I went down from 281 to 252, Jeez. like in the last two months. So Wow. You're giving a kidney to your sister. How how long have you known she needs a kidney? Oh, my, for about six years already. Jeez. Yeah. So are you are you nervous about that? Are you excited about it? What's it like emotionally to give away a kidney? Oh, I, I know, it's nothing. It's, it's, you know, it's a gift for life. <laughs> I was given a second chance, so why not? I'm going to work really hard, too, to call you Suave instead of Rico. Remember that old... Uh, no, no, no. Remember, <laughs> you've heard that one before. You remember that old guy in the uh, yeah, in the yeah. 90s? Rico, Suave. Someone says there's some painful memories of the, there are people calling That's you that. painful memories. Never that. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, welcome to The Aggressive Life. This podcast is all about pushing you to take control of your life, to steer the ship of your life. Climb the mountain and take new ground. And whenever I come across someone who has done that under incredible stress and strain, that's somebody I want to live and learn with. Especially somebody who just gave away a kidney, as you just heard. No, I'm, I'm giving it away. You're giving it away? Giving? In March. In March it is. <laughs> Luis Suave Gonzalez has done that, and he's still doing it. He's giving things away. He grew up under challenging circumstances in the Bronx and then Philly. Suave was involved in a street fight that left one young man dead. He was arrested and sentenced to life in prison without parole. He was only 17 years old at that time. His time in prison started just as hard as his life outside. Repeat offenses landed him in solitary confinement. And it was there he began to discover the power of education. He couldn't read or write, but talking with a, another inmate through the walls, he began to learn. And the inmate would teach him words and how to spell them, and Suave would memorize them. He kept learning, eventually getting his GED and then earning a BA from Villanova University. He encouraged other guys around him to do the same, seeing education as key to helping others walk a different path. Suave started a scholarship for local students, raising money from himself and other prisoners to get it started. Then in 2016, Suave's life turned upside down. A landmark Supreme Court trial reversed the imprisonment for minors, giving him the chance to be free. And after serving 31 years, he was released in 2017, and he hasn't slowed down. His story and his transition back to society was chronicled in the Pulitzer Prize winning podcast, Suave. He continues to champion education, create original artwork, and even teaches a course at the University of Pennsylvania. His art, activism, and storytelling are incredibly inspiring. And that was all before he decided to give a kidney. So welcome to The Aggressive Life, Suave Gonzalez. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're welcome. I'm, I, I'm honor, honored to be here, honored to share this story. And um, hopefully somebody out there can hear it and um, get their life together. How often do you tell this story? I mean, as I'm looking at this thing and thinking about your life, I'm going, this is this is better than any movie out there. This is intense. How, you got to be, are you getting tired of telling your story? No, not really, because, you know, it, it, it's life changing for some people. Uh, me going out and I travel a lot. I, I just came back from D.C. for a conference, a uh, four day conference. I travel a lot telling the story, and I always tell people, man, it can happen to you. A lot of the time, people think that you can end up in prison because you did something wrong or or, 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 or you committed a crime. Sometimes you could just be hanging with the wrong people at the wrong time like it happened to me and end up in prison serving a lengthy time. And uh, I tell my story because I understand that by telling it, I'm educating people on how the system treat children when they get locked up. Yeah, so you let's go back, if you don't mind. You said you were hanging out with the wrong people at the wrong time. What what happened on that fateful day? Well, I'm not going to get into 
details, but I tell you what, um, it was a fight, neighborhood fight. Uh, one group of people got into another fight with another group of people. Somebody pulled out the gun. Somebody got shot. And me being from New York, I was brought up with a call of the streets where you're not supposed to snitch nobody out. You live with that. So when people got arrested, I kept my mouth shut. And in keeping my mouth shut, that means you got you bought that. You bought the case because in the state of PA, if you were somebody that commit a crime, it's just as if you committed a crime. And they charged me as if I committed a crime, even though I didn't pull the trigger. Hmm. So you go into, into prison. You don't know how to read. H- explain this, how, how you learn in solitary confinement. Like, what's the system to learn how to read when you're not even looking at a book? Well, for me, uh, I go in and IQ 56, certified by the state of New York in the state of Pennsylvania, 56, mentally retarded. So I go in and, you know, the first 10 years was wilding out. The first 10 years was trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. So um, one day I got into a fight with a guard and that landed me in solitary confinement for seven years. Seven years? Seven years. By yourself for seven years? By myself. Sheesh. Yes. So so while there, um, I was receiving letters from my mother that I couldn't read. So I used to pay other people, like I buy cupcakes and coffee. Hey, read this letter for me. So one time we had a individual that told me, how about if I show you how to read and write? So he started giving me words through the bars. Like I've never even seen this guy's face. Cat, dog, mom, simple words. And Little by little, I kept building up. So every time he gave me the word, I memorized it. And that's how I learned how to read and write. Fascinating. I got a good memory. I got. I came up with a good... See, when you illiterate like that, um, you have to memorize street signs. And you have to... I used to memorize whole songs before I even learned how to read and write. Hmm. When you're... Let's go back to the beginning, Suave. To, before you get to prison, before that fateful fight. Like, what, what was your upbringing like? Where, where did you live? What was your family life like? What? Uh, just give us a glimpse into what made you you at that point. Well, I was, I, was, I was born and raised in the Bronx, New York, all the way to the age of 16. Mm-hmm. I was only in Philadelphia like six months before all this happened. So I, basically, I was born and raised in the Bronx. Uh, Typical Bronx, it was the Reaganomics days, welfare, cheese, peanut butter, um, you know, didn't come from a rich family, so we had to go out there, hustle, pack bags in the supermarket, you know, traditional New York life. Mm. And one day, my mother decided that she wanted to move from the Bronx to Philadelphia because she thought it was a better way of living. And in actuality, it wasn't because we went from the South Bronx into this place called the Badlands in Philadelphia. So what she did took us out of one bad place and put us in a deeper worse shithole that had no return. Yeah, right. You know, North Philly was hell oh, in the eighties, and that's when all this just happened. Yes, it's filthy Delphia, the whole city, filthy Delphia. Oh yeah, 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 it is. <laughs> we just lost all of our listeners, Dirt, from from filthy Dirt. You you should have grown up in filthy Delphia. It'd been perfect for it you. Would've, it would have fit me. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. So when you are, you're growing up, you get put in prison. It's a tough, it's a tough thing. Is prison, is there some level of reprieve from prison in the sense that I mean, someone's at least feeding you and you got a secure uh, bed or is it, no, it's no secure. It's hell. It's worse than the worst days in the Bronx or Philadelphia. I mean, listen, in the 80s, SCI gratis for worse the fifth largest institution in the soil of America and one of the worst ones. Murder, rape, extortion, everything was going down in that place. Everything. And here you got a 17-year-old kid that got to survive that. Mm. So my mentality was I'm going to survive by any means necessary. So I be, I left my humanity and adopted a whole new uh, um, identity, which was if you.
with me, there's a price to pay. And I became that. I became that incorrigible person that they said I was in the system. Mm. I became that. And I needed that to survive. There was no other way to survive in that place. Right. Yeah, totally makes sense. So solitary confinement for seven years, that is, that's not even legal anymore. In fact, there's a lot of states that have outlawed period solitary confinement is too inhumane. Did you find solitary confinement to be as horrible as I think it would be? Oh, solitary confinement is horrible, man. It's like, um, it's like living in hell because after a while you forget what day of the week is, Hmm. what year it is, unless they tell you, uh, not being able to hear or really touch another human person. And seven years, that play on your mind. So you got to find other ways to entertain yourself. Um, For me, it was learning how to read and write. To me, it was learning how to paint. So solitary confinement was like, solitary confinement was hell on earth. Um, You got people that go bananas crazy and start throwing shit at the guard. And and in the process, they might get you because you're in the way going, you're getting exhorted to the shower. So it was hell. But I always knew in my heart that I needed a change. Solitary confinement gave me that change. To me, solitary confinement was a, a place where I learned how to really, really peer the layers that I was living behind and and, and become myself. Yeah. Oh, become yourself. And become myself. Become somebody that I love and respect. That's pretty impressive to learn how to write in solitary confinement and then get your GED. How long did it take you to get your GED? Or did you get that while you were in solitary confinement? Well, uh, I got out of solitary confinement and I went for my GED. I tried seven times. Mm. Seven times I tried, and on my seventh time, I got it. <laughs> was that a highlight of your life at that point? Oh, yeah. At that time, it was the biggest highlight yeah. because it was like I was the first one in my family to receive a GED, so I was happy. I was breaking that 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 cycle of that curse. And then, you know, after that, I said, you know what? I want to keep learning. I want to keep learning. So I began... I signed up for college, mm. and that's when I began my college journey. How does that work, going to college while you're in prison? Well, back then, it was a college program, and it was uh, part-time studies. So it took it actually took 16 years to get a bachelor's degree. Again, wow. si- okay. six, 16 years to get a bachelor's degree. So the way we did it was they come in, one semester per year and you sign up, you take the class, you had no, you had no choice in what classes you take is whatever they bring It's whatever they bring. And, mm-hmm. um, so I did that and so I completed and I completed in 2015. And when they come, is it like a classroom setting? You're sitting in a classroom with other inmates or what does that look like? It is. It's a classroom setting. Um, the, the professor come in, they teach for three months, then they're gone for the rest of the year, then they come back again for another three months at the end of the year. So you only took like maybe two classes a year. Okay, right. That's why it takes 16 years for you to get your degree at that time. <laughs> Gosh, wow. And, and how many people in the prison sign up for that? Is it a common thing because, hey, it's something to do, or is there a few people who do it? Oh, no, it's not a common thing, man. Um, and the reason it's not a common thing is because the jail that I was in, everybody was a lifer. Mm. Everybody was a lifer. So it was like, why are you going to go get a degree when you're never going home? Yeah. And that's that, that used to be the talk that people used to say. And I used to always tell people, I want to be ready on day one. I want to be ready on day one. And... I completed it, man. It was hard because there was no computers. Everything was done based on one book. You had to do use your own experience. But I learned how to work it, you know, because um, 
Again, I know how to survive, and he's, and you can put me in the in in, in the country. I'm gonna survive. Mm-hmm. You put me in the wilderness. I'm gonna survive. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and I learned how to survive that system, and I played it, and I and I became the first um, person in my family to have an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree, GD, associate's degree, and bachelor's degree. That's that's fantastic. So you spent 31 years behind bars. And yep. then the law changed or something changed for you to get out. Like, how did you learn that, hey, things have changed. I'm getting out. What was what was that day like? Well, in, the, in them 31 years I spent in prison, you know, I went from being a knucklehead to becoming a, a leader in the prison. Um, so I was the president of the Latino organization that we had over a thousand members. And I used to stay up with the law. I follow all the Supreme Court cases. I follow law, you know. Um, and then when the Grant case came out in Florida, which stated that you could not give a juvenile life in prison for a nonviolent offense, I was like, okay, this is it. Mm. If the Supreme Court is taking that case, it would not be long before they deal with juvenile life as they've been in prison. Um, for 30, 40 years for homicide cases and the hole and below. Five years later, we got the Montgomery decision, which stated you cannot put a juvenile in prison for life without giving them uh, a chance to redeem themselves. What that means is that everybody that went to prison at the age of 13, 14, 15 that was serving life in the United States, which was only 2,500 people, hmm. Um, could now have a chance to go back to the court and get resentenced. So when you go back to get resentenced, you're just saying, what, what's your plea? And is it everybody who goes back to get resentenced? Everyone's released immediately? How's that work? No. Nah, you go back, you stand in front of the judge, they look at your prison records and see what you've done in the last 25, 30 years, whatever time you've been in prison. When I stood in front of the judge, the judge, you know, they had no choice, man. I went, I went in there with a GED, social degree, bachelor's degree. I started a scholarship. I raised thousands and thousands of dollars for children of incarcerated parents. Mm. Um, I was a ghostwriter by this time for different people. I wrote five of my own books. I created countless prison programs. I got the support of state reps, state senators, judges, you know, I went in there prepared hmm. oh, because awesome. I knew because I knew I only got one chance. Yes. I'm you're not going back in front of a judge. Once you go there, you got one chance. And when I went in there, um, the judge said it, you know, like you are the reception, you making it complicated for other people. And I was like, no, nah, my case should not be used as a benchmark for nobody else. Because I was in a prison where we was able to create these programs. We was able to do stuff that benefited us. In the state of Pennsylvania, let me be clear, lifers are not allowed to get enrolled in educational program. Right. You know, so I was one of the lucky few that was able to create programs and, and be part of them at the same time. You know, so it's not fair to say you are the reception. Mm-hmm. So I went in, they gave me time served. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you you get out when they when the judge says, "Okay, we're going to commute your sentence." Is that like the next day you're out, or when does no, that no, happen? No, it, w- it wasn't commuted. It's lifetime parole. Okay, lifetime parole. Yeah. And is that the next day where that kicks in, or what does that look like? No, it kicks in that day. Wow. The, that- <laughs> the day the day you go to court, that's when that kicks in. Now I got to get a release date from the jail. So it took three it took three months for me to get released. Three months. Paperwork. Because it takes pay, you got to do a lot of paperwork. I'm sorry for asking all these questions, Suave. It's just it's just a world that I haven't experienced firsthand. So I find it find it fascinating whenever I talk to somebody who's been in prison or whenever I go to prison, I like to just ask these questions. I, we did a thing at a couple of institutions here in Ohio not too long ago. But this one's a new one that I haven't encountered before. When you find out that you are going to be getting out 
What's it like inside? Are people excited for you? Are they jealous? They don't really care? How's that work? Oh, nah. You got to remember, man. I come, I'm in a jail where it's the fifth largest prison in the United States, one of the worst ones in the state. So there's jealousy, there's envy. But at the same time, my name's Suave Gonzalez. Even though I haven't been in trouble in 20 years in the prison system, right? Uh, people always knew that it's, I, it was still there. I was still there. It was no thing. You know, it was still there. Uh, I wasn't looking for trouble, but if it came, I'm going to handle it. Right. Don't wake a sleeping dog. So, so to me, what the superintendent of that jail did, as soon as I got resentenced, she put me outside, low custody. So I was in jail, but I was outside the jail. What they call the trailers. Oh, okay. And I went home from out there from the trailers. So the day you're set free, what do you do that day? The day I'm set free, uh, I threw up a lot. They came and picked me up, my brother and my attorney. I came and I was throwing up. But even though I was throwing up, I went directly to speak to children at a school. Why were you throwing up? Uh, I haven't been in a car in <laughs> oh, wow. years, bro. Wow. Like, uh, yeah, I was, I was car sick. Jeez. I was car sick. I was throwing up. And from there, I went directly to speak to uh, uh, high school. Gosh. Immediately, you're trying to be Same a blessing that. to others. Immediately, you're trying to pour into other people. Same day. Wow. I, I, I didn't have a party. I didn't have a meal. I went to a school, spoke to the kids, apologized to my community. What did you say to those kids? And what do you say to those sort of kids right now today? Listen, that it's everything is cool. It's it's it's, it's cool to be in school. Uh, don't follow my footsteps. Don't believe everything you you read in them in them urban fiction books that I wrote. Those was just stories. Um, um and yeah. that's it. And, and and stay in school. And I became a mentor to a lot of them kids in school. But your story is is so good. You know, this this podcast is called The Aggressive Life because we're trying to get people to take steps. Don't wait for something good to happen to you. Don't wait for something, uh, you know, the finger of God to dip his little sugar finger in your life and sweeten it up. Do what you can do. Take advantage of what you can take advantage of. And so for you, like, hey, I'm in solitary confinement. No better time than now to start to read. Hey, I'm in prison. Got nothing better to do. May as well start on my college education. There's just these these aggressive moves you took again and again and again. What I find fascinating too about it, Swab, you know, I'd like to hear your opinion on this. You didn't start these moves because you say, hey, you know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 15 years from now, whatever it is, I'm going to need a really great resume so, uh, so that a judge lets me out. You were doing these things because you wanted to do better and good things, right? I was doing these things because the older I got in prison, you know, you got to remember, I went in at 17, came out when I was 50. So the older I got, I was like, damn, I got to leave a legacy, man. And my legacy can't be that he's up the guards and he's fighting the guard. It can't be that. I don't want it to be that. Um, and I realized that even though I was in prison, I still could make a difference. But in able to make that difference, I had to get truth with myself. I had to come to, to the understanding like, yo, bro, you there's some things you need to change. Right. And one of the things I needed to change was that everything don't have got to get resolved with violence. Everything don't have to get resolved with a knife. You know, um, right. once I start peeling them layers off, myself and realizing like, damn, I'm a pretty good dude. I just haven't been given the opportunity to display that. I started creating them opportunities for myself, right? And that's when I created the educational incarcerating scholarship. I went around the prison and asked people for $1. And for those they know, a dollar in prison is a lot of money. Mm. People only make 19 to 22 cents an hour mm. working. For them to give you a dollar, and I raised a couple of thousand dollars for the scholarship, and I kept that going for eight years, mm. right? Yep. So now 
not only is I'm doing something good, I created a platform where other people could feel like, then I'm contributing to that. I'm doing something good, you know, and little by little, we began to change the morale of the jail. You know, we went from a, from a, from a jail that was violent and vicious to a jail where everything was programmed. Yeah. You know, right after that, uh, I was instrumental in creating the mural arts pro um, program where we painted 52 murals from inside the prison that are now gracing the city of Philadelphia. So, you know, I, I was like, I always believe that if I'm, if I'm to be part of these programs, I got to create them because the DOC is not going to let me in their program because lifers are not allowed to be in these programs. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I just started creating programs that I know I could be part of and benefited from it. And in the process, what happened was hundreds and hundreds of people saw it. Now they want to be part of it. So now I went from being um, involved with all the illegal stuff to being responsible for bringing meaningful educational program to a general population that perhaps would not have them. Yeah. And you talk about a lot of this stuff on your uh, your great podcast called Suave. When you're on that podcast talking about your background, is it painful at all to relive it? I mean, it's pain. It's always painful reliving your past, right? Because a lot of you know you don't always want to be like that. I used to be that way. Right. That was me. Right. But it's needed because I don't think people understand. You know, today people refer to me as, "Oh, that's the Pulitzer Prize winner." Yes, I'm happy to be the first formerly incarcerated person in America to win a Pulitzer Prize. I'm happy to be that. I'm happy to be, but at the same time, I am a former juvenile lifer. I'm still on lifetime parole, ASO 834. That's my number. I can never forget that number, right? So really, to me, it's about changing. To me, it's about letting people know that anything is possible, who would have thought, Brian, that a person that learned how to read in his late 20s, right, would now be a Pulitzer Prize winner? Right. A person that the state of New York and the state of Pennsylvania said he's mentally retarded with an IQ of 56. I didn't give myself that title. The state did that. Mm. Right. But now I'm sitting in front of you and telling you, yeah, I was a lifer. Yeah, I had 10 to 20. Yeah, I had two and a half to five, plus a life without parole. But guess what? I'm free. Yep. I'm here in front of you letting you know that that don't define who I am. Yes. That I didn't let that become me. You know, it affected my life. It traumatized me because I had to live them 31 years, day one day at a time. But I survived. I'm okay with that. I, I'm alive, Right. Oh, yeah. And, it's unbelievable, and, man. Anything is possible, man. And I just want people to know anything is possible. If you don't believe in miracles, look at me. How the miracle came? Also, the miracle came because you did the right stuff, too. Right? Let's not lose that. Miracles do happen, but it's, it's very rarely passive. I did a study in the um, New Testament. You know, Jesus, the greatest miracle worker of all time. 30, 31 miracles, I count in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 24 of them he does in response to somebody taking initiative. Five of the other seven of them, he still tells them to do something, like go down and wash, wash the mud off your face, something like that. So the, the miracles do happen, but they also happen because someone puts themselves in a place for the miracle to happen, which is oh, what you absolutely. did. absolutely. Absolutely. You got to play your part. You got to play your part, man. Absolutely. You got. You definitely got to be the one that take the initiative. Nobody's going to do it for you, especially if you're in a prison in solitary confinement where everybody's doing life. Nobody cares you live or die. You know, the only thing they care is about them three meals and, and, and probably getting an extra trade from the guard. So you had to play your part. You got to be self-disciplined. You have to believe in God too. Mm. Like, let's not leave that out. Yep. I didn't grow up in a religious household. So to me, it was hard to accept that, yeah, God could get me out. Right? I always said it like, I, you know, it's going to take God because I didn't believe it. I didn't believe I was coming home. Mm -hmm. yep. That's facts. I didn't believe that. 
uh, uh, Bagaha of the plans. And I'm going to tell you a story real quick. I remember one time being in solitary confinement, right? And I was so depressed. I was real depressed. And I, you know, I said, you know what? Today is the day, man. I'm going to end this shit. I'm not going to give the state no more, more, no more time. So I, I tied the sheet up, tied it up against the vent and on the wall. And I, I, oh, I had it planned out. I had it planned out. And I was telling my Christian homies in another cell, I'm going to show you that there is no God, right? I'm going to show you. And, you know, that night came around. I put the, I put the sheet up. I, I climbed on top of the toilet, put that shit around my neck, and the whole thing broke twice. Mm, wow. Twice. Mm. And then I heard a voice that said, not today, buddy. <laughs> I heard that voice. I'm yeah. serious. I heard it. Not today. Mm -hmm. Right? And at the time, I was like, oh, I had an old sheep. But today, I could tell you, that was God. Yeah. Right. That was God. What's he mean to your life now? How how do you interact with him now on a daily basis? Come on, that's my that's my that's without it you can't do nothing. You know, without it I can't do nothing. And I'm still not a, a very religious person, but I do believe. And I always tell people if you don't believe, look, look, just look at me. I was serving life without the possibility of parole. Yeah. That means I was supposed to die in jail. Pulitzer Prize. Did you apply for that or does somebody find out your work and then they just bestow it on you? Brian, my team never knew that we was even being nominated for it. We find out the same way the world find out about it. Hmm. When they make the announcement on CNN. Wow. And everybody was like, "You want? I didn't even know what a Pulitzer Prize was. <laughs> but that's how we find out like everybody right. else. That's unbelievable. And what was the Pulitzer Prize for? Audio recording for the Suave podcast. Now, you, you started a friendship. You started a really great friendship with a journalist, Maria Anahosa, from behind bars. How did that all happen? Because I think that was a significant thing that got you going in the right direction when you got outside, right? When I was in solitary confinement, um, I came out. And somebody gave me a radio. The radio only had like three stations. And one of the stations that, that was playing, I'm not going to say it because they're not endorsing the show yet. But but uh, it was the station that her show was being played. So I heard the voice and I ain't know this is a Latino woman on radio. Remember, I'm in the boondocks in Pennsylvania where you don't hear nothing but country music. So to hear somebody that sound like you was refreshing. So I started hearing it. And then I, one of my buddies, he was the jailhouse tutor. And that year, uh, he graduated like 21 people with GED. And they gave him the option to bring the guest speakers. And I was like, bro, you got to get her. Somehow they got her into the prison. I snuck into the graduation. I sat in the bench. I heard her. And at the end, um, when she was done speaking, I asked her, you know, I'm, I'm from New York and such and so we hit it off. And I asked her, what can I do? I already know that there's nothing that a journalist could do for me. I'm serving life. So I was like, what can I do to make this time? And she was like, you could be my sauce. You could be the sauce. And that's what kicked it off. And then before she left, she said these simple words to me. You could become the voice for the voiceless. Hmm. And dumb, simple words. At the time, I didn't really know what they meant, but they turned my life around completely. I got up from the bench. I went to the bathroom and flushed a whole bunch of weed that I had in my pocket that I wanted to sell to the graduates. Because graduation, graduates come in, money fly around. That's when people bring all types of stuff. And I say, I'm going to give me some money today. And But I flushed the week because I felt so bad because her speech was so good. And every word that she said felt like she was talking to me. Even though we was in an auditorium, it just felt like everything she was saying applied to me. And everybody in the auditorium was asking her, uh, can you take my case? Can you do this? I never even talked 
about my case with Maria to 2017. Hmm. Man. So how how is it that you your your journey, your battle right now in prison reform? How do you carry that on? Your podcast obviously is one way and What's uh when you wake up you say, Hey man, I want to be about reforming prisons. Like what needs to be done in your in your opinion? Well, with me, what the way I carry it is I work at Community College of Philadelphia. I oversee a program called the IMO program, which is a program for formerly incarcerated people and for anyone that's been justice impact. I get them in school for free. Mm-hmm. Based on scholarships. I carry, you know, throughout the years, my my um, activism has changed a little bit because I went into I'm in the academia um, type um, lane right now but I use my podcast I own my own network true crime true story network you can find it on Apple Spotify whatever um, and I use my platform to really educate I use my story because I found that people don't want to hear theories people want to see the real deal you know so I use myself. I tell people I went to jail with an IQ for 56. It's possible. Um, but the system still need a whole lot of things to reform, man. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the missing pieces that the system need is to implement college in the, in, in the prisons. Mm. Mandatory. We should make education a mandatory piece for anyone to make parole because statistically, and statistics say that a person that have a higher education, why in prison, would not recidivate. It's a very low recidivism rate for people that come out with degrees. That's facts. Mm. Yep. So why not do it when we got a captive audience? You know, a lot of the time people always want to say it's public safety. How is educating somebody in prison public safety? Talk I- to me. I never go into prison without having the same thought every single time. I think, yeah, I am one bad day away from being in here myself. One bad decision, one bad day, I could be in here. I feel that way every single time. You know, that was your situation, you know? You know it, it, it can, listen, it can happen to anyone. Um, it, I know people, they've done stuff. I know people that never did anything and end up in prison. My friend just got exonerated. Eddie Ramirez, 28 years, right? So it, this could happen to anyone, anyone. That's the thing that people need to understand. You could be walking with somebody and just get pulled over and get accused of a crime and end up in prison for life. What, per- you know, uh, what percent of the people when you're in prison – did you say that the percent that was in here? Did you say, man, I'm glad these dudes are in here. <laughs> they need to be in here. And what percent of the people said you thought, ah, these guys shouldn't be in here? I mean, let me be honest with you, right? There are some people in prison that I would never, ever, ever would like to live next to or have my grandmother live next to them. Right. Yep. That's that that is facts. But there's also people that throughout the year has transformed their life, right? That if you put back in the prison system, out in society, they would do more better than than what they ever have in their life. Yes. You know, I know people that just got caught up because of the circumstances. A lot of the crimes in prison are economic crimes. People, they're doing it to survive out here. And I'm not one to say, don't let that person out. Don't let this person out. I just don't want that person next to me and in, in my, in my neighborhood, in my community. Right. Because I, because I live with them. I know, I know what it takes. I know what they would do if they get put back in a situation where they don't have no supervisions. But it's not my decision to say, let them in or let them out. Your accomplishments Suave are really unbelievable. And we're only talking about a couple of them. Yeah. Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, able to endure seven months, six months, whatever it was in solitary confinement, learn no, how to read. Se- seven years. Seven, seven years. years. Sorry. Seven. You remember every one of those months. So it was more than that. Seven years, getting a college education in there. Just, just tick off more of them. Just, just, what else? Go ahead, bragging yourself. Or what else has God done through your life? I mean, I wrote. I wrote like 15 books for people, ghost wrote for a bunch of authors. I wrote five of my own books. Uh, 
I created a scholarship. I ran an organization with almost a thousand members. I gave out, I used to give out turkey drives from in, from in prison. Um, I created like 30 prison programs that um, hundreds of people benefited from. Started, uh, if you if you may say, a radio career, because I used to call radio stations from in prison and give my two cents. So all this was preparing me. All this was preparing me. Oh, and I became an artist. And I started a restorative justice program called the Mural Arts Restorative Justice Program, where we painted 52 murals, full-blown murals, for the city. Of, they are not gracing the city of Philadelphia. Yeah. And still, that wasn't enough. My greatest accomplishment was when we did this film called Prison Dialogue, A Message to the Youth, that was shown to the youth at every school in the state of Pennsylvania. To this day, when I see uh, uh, someone that come up to me and say, hey, you saved my life. That's what it's all about, man. You know, somebody that was 13, 14 at the time, that's now is 30 years old telling you, if it wasn't for you, I'd be in jail or dead. You know, yeah. it don't get no better than that. You know, that's all. I don't need no rewards for that because I'm only doing what I was put on this earth to do. Yes. Which is to try to prevent the youth from making the same mistakes I made. So you, you know, and to me, that's what that's what matters. You're obviously a self starter, Suave. You started all these things and have taken initiative. If you look back before you were 17, were you always a self starter, or is that something that got developed in you somewhere later in life? Well, I was brought up by a single mother, and my mother sold beer, my mother sold soda, my mother sold fried food, my mother did whatever she had to do to survive and take care of her six babies. And she always taught us, do not sit around and wait for somebody to do anything for you. Go do it yourself. Do okay. it yourself. Yep. Uh, you know, so I came up in in a household where it didn't matter what somebody think about you. Right. What matter is that you got up and you tried it didn't work, but try it again. Yes. Right. And that's the way I that's the way I function in life. I'm not one that depend on people to do anything. I just go do it. If I want to create a program, I just write it out, research it and just implement it. Uh, if I if I want if I don't know something, I'm going to study it and, and learn it. Yep. But I'm not the one that's going to be complaining. I'm not the one that's going to tell you it's bad out here. Society's no good. I'm not the one that's going to complain about food. Um, there's been time. There was time when I came home that I didn't have a job. That I had to survive on food stamps. And a friend of mine from California named Kevin o, um, McCracken, which is now my partner in my media company, had to pay my cable so I could have internet so I could continue doing podcasts when home. Uh, but there was time where I just buy three cases of oodles and noodles and I ate that for the month. And I was cool with that because yep. that's how I survived in prison. <laughs> Get that, a jar of peanut butter, some bread, some jelly. I got me a meal. Yeah, I wasn't complaining. You know why? Because I was free. And, am I, and I always say, if God got me out of prison, got me this far, he ain't going to let me go hungry. I might not have steaks. I might not have the chicken, but I always had something to eat. Yeah. You know, so I'll, I'll never forget that. i never forget that it could be worse. So I don't complain. You're, you mentioned God a lot, but you said you're not religious. What does it mean for you to be religious? What does that mean? Oh, I don't know. I've never been religious. I, I'm just a strong believer in God. Hmm. Yeah. I've never been religious. I don't go to church. I go, I, sometimes I do go and, and leave because, you know, it's not me. But I, I do have my own ministry. You know, I believe that what I'm doing is my ministry is my call. Um, helping people get in school, helping people um, get into housing, helping people get what they need when they come home on day one, helping people get their IDs, helping people um, um, reacquaint themselves. Um, helping people get into counseling. That's my ministry. It's a ministry. Mm. And if, if you don't have God, you think this 
will be able and possible. No. So it got to be God. Now, do uh, am I a religious fanatics? No, I don't carry the Bible. No, I don't read it. I haven't read it in a long time. But I still believe, bro, that me being free is a miracle from God, is a blessing from God. God is the only one that can open that door for a lifer to do what I'm doing. Yeah. So what's your next aggressive move you're going to make with your belief in God? Like, where's he taking you right now? You got any big project on the horizon you're working on? Let me tell you, right? I was walking to work today, right? And I found me a dollar. Mm. Yeah. I found me a dollar, right? You know what I'm going to do with that dollar? That's my dollar, when by I, the way. That's my dollar. I appreciate you returning it. Oh, yeah. You I'll just, you just stole it from me. But, but I'm turn then, you in. You know, to me, to me, <laughs> to me, even this dollar means, oh, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. For some people, oh, it's just a dollar. But can you wrap your mind around this, right? That for 30 years, I was never able to do this with a dollar. Oh, wow. I never even saw a dollar in 30 years. So to me, these are signs from God that, yo, blessings are coming. And blessings comes every day in different ways. Uh, my next big project, I, I got my network. Truth Crime, Two Story on Apples, Spotify, wherever you get. I'm working on a film project. I can't put the Hollywood producer out name yet because they got to announce first, but it's a big producer. Um, so we're working on that. Suave season two be out in the next few months. Um, yeah, it's a lot of big projects, man. A lot of big projects coming. Yeah, that's great stuff. Swabe, anything you want to talk about that we haven't talked about yet? No, yeah. Let, let me say this, man. Thank you, and thank you, your production team out there, for giving um, opportunities to people, man, to come on the on the platform and share their um, their ideas, the work that they're doing after prison. I think people need to understand that people just don't come home and just want to party and just want to celebrate. A lot of people that come home are putting in that work. That's to right. rebuild the to rebuild the community we help destroy. Yeah. So if someone wants to follow up with you, see some of your see some of your programs. Is there any one stop shop we can go to? Oh yeah, just go to um, Morton Contemporary Art Gallery. Um, you see my work. Oh, big announcement! Let me say this: big announcement. By the time this this podcast come out, my work will be inducted into the Smithsonian Museum. And Washington, they picking up some of the artwork that I've done in the prison system. That's 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 major, man. That's that, awesome. I, I think that's bigger than winning the Pulitzer. That's great. Do you really? You feel better about that? Oh, of course, man. You know, I mean, to have your work in the Smithsonian forever. Right. Come on, man. Of course. Yeah. Who knows of who course. won the Pulitzer? You know, a year ago, two years ago, twenty years ago. But you're right. If you're in the Smithsonian forever, that's a pretty cool gig. Yeah. So um, that's happening. Yeah, and stay tuned for season two, Suave. Man, thanks so much for being generous with your time, generous with your wisdom, and generous with your your energy. Really, really good, man. I, I wish, uh, I hope we meet someday live face to face. Man, listen, anytime you need a commentator, let me know. I'll be there, all right? <laughs> all right, Suave. Hey, you got something today, everybody. This is a man who's moved in his life. He's still moving. I don't care if you're in a prison of emotional issues. I don't care if you're in a spiritual prison. I don't care if you're in a financial prison. You can't get to a new place with God, but you have to move. You've got to make steps just like my new friend Suave has. We'll see you next time on The Aggressive Life. Stay tuned for the next chapter. Thanks for joining us on this journey toward aggressive living. Find more resources, articles, past episodes, and live events over at bryantome.com. My new books, a repackaged edition of The Five Marks of a Man and a brand new Five Marks of a Man tactical guide are open right now on Amazon. If you haven't yet, leave this podcast a rating and review. It really helps get the show in front of new listeners. And if you want to connect, find me on Instagram at Brian Tome. The Aggressive Life is a production of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio.